Hello and welcome everybody to this Constitution Unit event about prospects for the House of Commons Modernisation Committee. I'm Meg Russell, I'm Director of the Constitution Unit and I'll be chairing today's discussion. The Labour Party manifesto for July's general election promised to, I quote, establish a new modernisation committee tasked with reforming House of Commons procedures, driving up standards and improving working practices. In the short parliamentary sitting before the summer recess, the House of Commons agreed a motion to establish such a committee, and a few days ago its members were announced. Crucially, unlike most other select committees, the Modernisation Committee will be chaired by a government minister, the leader of the House of Commons, Lucy Powell. The Conservative shadow leader will also be among its members. While this seems unusual, in key respects, it echoes an arrangement that existed under the last Labour government, which set up a modernisation committee in 1997, chaired by the Leader of the House, which existed until the arrival of the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition in 2010. A key question for today's discussion is what the new committee can learn from its predecessor. What worked well and less well with the original committee? How will a new committee be different? What should it do and what does it seem likely to do? We're joined by an expert panel to discuss these questions and more. Our first speaker will be Dr. Tom Fleming of the Constitution Unit. Along with Hannah Kelly, also on the screen, um, Tom's conducting a project on the politics of parliamentary reform. And Tom and Hannah recently published a report, which I think there'll be a link dropped into the chat so that you can access it on what works in terms of parliamentary reform, drawing lessons from the old modernization committee and other committees. We'll then hear from Greg Power, who alongside me was a special advisor to Robin Cook as leader of the House of Commons, a frighteningly long time ago, 2001 to 2003, uh, supporting Robin's work on the modernization committee. He subsequently did the same for Peter Hain as leader of the House, 2003 to 2005. Greg now works internationally advising parliaments as founder and board chair of Global Partners Governance. Our third speaker will be Dr. Sue Griffiths, who's a former parliamentary clerk and among her many roles in the House of Commons, she served as clerk to the Modernization Committee 2007 to eight, therefore after Greg, when it was chaired by Harriet Harman. Sue is now managing director of Social Development Direct. Each of our three panelists will speak for about five minutes each, after, we'll have some, after which we'll have some brief discussion between us as a panel before opening up to audience questions. You can submit your question by using the Q&A function of Zoom, and Hannah Kelly here will be selecting from among them and putting questions to the panelists. You can choose if you wish to submit your question anonymously, otherwise she'll also share your name. This whole session, including the Q&A, is being recorded and will be available afterwards as a video and, and an episode of the Constitution Unit podcast. So you may want to bear that in mind when deciding whether to anonymise your question. That's more than enough from me. As chair, let me pass to our panellists, starting with Tom Fleming. Okay, thanks very much, Meg. So with my five minutes, I'm going to try and focus on doing two main things. First, I'll try to set the scene for our discussion by saying a little bit more about what we know so far about this new modernisation committee. And then I'll briefly touch on some relevant findings from the research Meg just mentioned that we did at the Constitution Unit into the previous modernisation committee that the House of Commons established under the last Labour government. So as Meg has said, this new modernisation committee, it was first promised in the Labour manifesto during the general election and then established back in July with a remit to consider reforms to the House of Commons procedures, practices, sorry, procedures, standards and working practices. And its membership was approved earlier this week, letting it start its work. It already held its first meeting very quickly and yesterday, Thursday, it published a memo from the leader of the House endorsing her proposed key aims for the committee's work. So based on all that, we now know a few key things about how the committee will actually go about its work and how that is similar or different to the previous modernization committee. So I'll focus on that for now, rather than the question of what reforms the committee might end up pursuing. So firstly, the committee is going to include members of the three largest parties, but not any of the, the smaller parties in the House or independents. It has 14 members, of which nine are from the Labour Party, three from the Conservative Party and two from the Liberal Democrats. That membership includes a mixture of both frontbench and backbench MPs, and this is unusual given that most select committees are usually only composed of backbenchers, but it echoes the approach taken by the earlier Modernisation Committee, which was also the same kind of mix, 
So of the 14 members, I think only eight are what we might think of as out and out backbenchers. It otherwise includes from Labour, the leader of the House, Lucy Powell, her parliamentary private secretary and a party whip. From the Conservatives, the shadow leader of the House and a party whip. And then also the Liberal Democrat chief whip. The leader of the House, as Meg has already mentioned, will, will actually chair the committee. And again, that's unusual, but is how the previous modernisation committee proceeded. The backbench members of the committee have actually been nominated by their party's whips rather than being elected by other MPs. And this is the same as how the original modernisation committee was appointed, but that's because all committees were appointed in that way um, back then. Since then, reforms in 2010 mean that members of most select committees are chosen by their fellow MPs in within party elections. We had the elections of uh, committee chairs this week, and then um, later in the autumn, we'll see the members being elected. So in that respect, this committee is unusual um, but also in a way that is different from its predecessor. Some of the other ways it's unusual are similar to the old modernisation committee. In this respect, the committee looks different from other committees now and from the past modernisation committee. And then lastly, on, on these sorts of what we already know type questions, the leader has suggested that the committee will work as something like a clearinghouse for reform ideas rather than operating like a normal select committee. It's not yet completely clear what this means, and I suspect we won't know until the committee starts actually getting up and running. But it seems to suggest some kind of attempt to bring together ideas from elsewhere and provide some sort of strategic coordination and momentum for the reform process. Turning to our research, uh, the recent Constitution Unit report by Hannah and myself that Meg mentioned studied different past approaches to developing reform proposals in the House of Commons, including the former Modernisation Committee. And I think two key findings from that work provide some important lessons for the new committee to think about. The first is perhaps encouraging for the committee. We found that its predecessor was notable for its ability to get proposals agreed by the House and implemented. Compared to the backbench procedure committee, which as now existed alongside, it had far more success at getting its proposals debated in the House of Commons and then also agreed. This suggests that being chaired by the leader of the House was quite a valuable asset as it increased reform proposals chances most of the time of getting at least some government backing, which is usually key for the success of procedural reform. The second lesson though is a bit more cautionary. Perhaps for some of the same reasons, the last committee was quite controversial compared to normal select committees. We can see this from the fact it held far more formal votes inside the committee rather than achieving consensus, in the fact its proposals often were met with votes in the House of Commons rather than being adopted unanimously, and more generally from the criticism it faced, fairly or not, as being some kind of vehicle for rubber stamping ideas that came from and therefore often benefited ministers. So being chaired by the leader was something of a double-edged sword. This helped the committee get its proposals adopted lots of the time, but it also made the committee and its proposals more controversial amongst MPs and particularly amongst the opposition. And I think this all suggests that one of the key challenges for this new committee to navigate will be to try to recreate its predecessor's strengths while avoiding some of the problems it faced. But I'll stop there. Wonderful, Frank. Thanks, Tom. That gets us off to a really good start, sort of setting the scene with where we are now. Uh, we're now going to go back um, a couple of decades <laughs> and start with Greg, uh, who's going to do his best to sum up some four years experience with the committee in uh, five or so minutes. Over to you, Greg. Thanks, Meg. Um, I've just realised how short um, five minutes is listening to Tom speak. Um, so <laughs> I, but I've no doubt Meg is going to interrupt me if I talk for too long. I, Saying we're going back a couple of decades, I last spoke about this, as Meg said, I'm mostly doing stuff internationally now. I last spoke about this uh, at the 40th anniversary of the Departmental Select Committees in, uh, in Port Cullis House. And afterwards, Paul Evans, who I can see is on this call, said to me, it was I was doing a double, double act with Tony Wright. And Paul's reflection was, it was like watching two old men in their rocking chairs and slippers, occasionally sucking their pipes and reminiscing about how good the old days were. Um, I'll try and avoid that, and I'll try and keep this relatively succinct. Um, as Meg mentioned, I was a special advisor for Robin and then Peter when they, Peter Hayne when they were leaders of the House of Commons, which was a very interesting period, quite a fertile period in terms of uh, both thinking about and implementing a lot of reforms um, during that period to the committees, to sitting hours, um, uh, to uh, legislation, and, and, uh, and also we did a lot of work um, ultimately on engaging with the public and set the groundwork for, for the Education Centre in Victoria uh, Victoria Tower and elsewhere. Um, 
the the way that the, the, from the inside of that process what what was interesting i was quite i had i pro, prior to working for robin i'd spent two years working at the hansard society running a commission on um uh, accountability and, and improving the scrutiny process at westminster and i came into into the job with a, quite a clear idea about what i thought needed to be done around the form of the house of commons um that didn't last very long because it hit the reality of politics and i was at the time, I was thinking a lot about Philip Norton's framework for thinking about how change happens in um, in the House of Commons. And he had th- he's got three broad rules. One is it tends to, to happen at the start of a new parliament. Secondly, there needs to be a clear set of proposals on which a leader of the House can draw. And then thirdly, there needs to be the, the political will. And I think that's useful, but it's not quite how it happened in, in that period. In the first instance, just take one of his um, suggestions. There were a lot of proposals around by the time that Robin Cook became leader of the House of Commons. And that's partly because during the 1990s, the Labour Party had made an issue of democratic reform generally and modernisation of the Commons was absolutely part of that. And they set up the the modernisation committee in 1997. And after a sort of relatively quick start under Anne Taylor, it then really did nothing for about three years. Um, once Margaret Beckett took over as leader of the House of Commons. The first year was there was some stuff on um, pre legislative scrutiny, carrying over of bills, timetabling and other stuff, but but it didn't actually fulfil a lot of the promise which seemed to be shaping Labour's approach to that, to, to reform of Parliament. And so what you had between that period of sort of 98 and 2001, there was a flurry of ideas. There was a Hansard Side Commission, which I was working on, uh, Philip Norton had his own commission for the Conservative Party. The liaison committee suddenly sort of came to life with a, a couple of very powerful reports about what needed to change. And Tony Wright himself was very active on the Public Administration Committee, pushing for some of this sort of stuff. So by the time Robin became leader, which was a surprise to him, as it was to most other people, because he thought he was still going to be Foreign Secretary after 2001, he came into that job, as he said to me and Meg at the time, wanting to leave some footprints in the sand. And he had a you know whole raft of ideas on, on which to base that. Um, but as you know, the, the second point, so, so those proposals were there. Um, the second point though, is that it's always, those, those plans always get blown out of the water by political events. Um, as Mike Tyson famously put it, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And we were well and truly punched in the mouth by, I think, the first or second PLP meeting of that parliament, where the nominations for the select committees were put forward to the PLP to approve, which at the time removed a couple of key committee chairs in the shape of Gwyneth Dunwoody and Donald Anderson. And what happened as a result of all that was that our plans to take the reform of parliament in in a relatively ordered manner were completely blown out of the water and we very quickly needed to look at what happened to the committees. But what happened as a result of that, what was quite a narrow issue about how uh, the chairs of committees are nominated, which was largely an internal PLP argument, turned into a much bigger report, which laid the ground for a lot of the current strengths of the committee system, including the creation of the scrutiny unit, uh, the payment of chairs for the first time, increased resources for committees, core tasks were introduced at that point, which I think fundamentally changed the way that committees have worked since, along with the reforms which happened, the, the right reforms a, a few years later. So, we'll, I mean, we'll see what happens in terms of events and in terms of attitudes, but there was clearly a mood for change within Parliament and a whole series of reforms on which parliament could draw so robin to some extent was moving with the grain but the third and the the final point that i'll make is this this role of the this double-edged sword this role of the leader of the house as chair of the committee which um has both its strengths and weaknesses and it depends largely i think on the personality and the political will of the leader of the house themselves Anne taylor i think came in in 97 as a genuine reformer but after about a year, Labour being in government for the first time in you know a couple of decades, they were put off because it was going to make governing more difficult if they made Parliament stronger. And Margaret Beckett came into that role very much as a business manager, as getting the government's business as expeditiously as possible. Robin came in really with nothing to lose. He knew it was his last job in government. He had some scores to settle, but he he had also been central to the Labour and Lib Dem talks during the 1990s with Robert McLennan, which set out a lot of these reforms and was regarded 
by almost everybody in Parliament as a parliamentarian. He cared about the the Commons and about its reform. And as he made the point in several speeches, you know, those of us who really care about Parliament are most adamant about its need for reform. It needs to stay relevant. It needs to stay powerful. Um, and the the one thing that I'll leave this. I mean, as you can tell, there's much more I could say, but I'll I'll draw it to to a conclusion. Just uh, one small thing in relation to that role of the leader of the house being also the chair of the committee. I would, when I first started working for Robin, I would be giving him briefing papers with entirely sensible, logical reforms for the House of Commons. And his first question would be, how do I get this past cabinet? How do I convince the ministers in cabinet that they should let me do this? And the, the problem also for the leader of the house is that for every other secretary of state, other cabinet ministers might disagree with them, but there's a degree of deference towards the education sector, or the home sector, or the foreign secretary. This is your patch. It doesn't apply to the leader of the house because every minister will have been an MP for some time and they know how parliament works. They know about procedure and they will argue because whatever the leader of the house proposes will change the way that they do their job. So there's a huge amount of resistance there. Robin, I mean, we'll perhaps we'll come to this in the conversation, but Robin had to very carefully navigate that path between keeping the backbenches on side and also keeping his government colleagues supportive so that he wasn't um, uh, completely uh, steamrolled by by his uh, fellow cabinet ministers. And I'll I'll finish there. Brilliant. Thank you, Greg. That's really fascinating. And there's obviously lots more you want to say, and there's lots more time to say it as well, because we'll come to discussion um, after we've heard from Sue. Over to you, Sue. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Meg. So uh, as Meg has said, I was the clerk of the Modernisation Committee in the 0708 Parliament, uh, after which session it ceased to meet uh, in the delicate phrasing of the Commons website. So in a way, I was present at the demise of the previous committee, uh, so I was going to offer a few reflections on why it ceased to be. Uh, and the background to that session was that it was the, the session when Gordon Brown came in as the new prime minister, taking over from Tony Blair. And he published a green paper called The Governance of Britain, uh, which set out some of his ideas for constitutional renewal, um, which ranged from such fascinating and scintillating topics as debating departmental annual reports and accounts, uh, to Parliament's role in authorising certain things like recall, dissolution, lawmaking powers, uh, and then had a whole section on regional accountability, which is actually what torpedoed ultimately the committee, and I can come on to that in a minute. But really, um, the committee was charged with uh, getting that agenda through, basically, uh, which was quite a break from the previous session where it had been chaired by Jack Straw, and they'd basically spent the entire session doing a massive report called Revitalising the Chamber, the Role of the Backbench Member, um, which is a brilliantly nerdy report that has loads of statistics in about what backbenchers spend their time on, um, attendance in debates, this, that and the other, and came up with a whole load of recommendations on a huge amount of things like inductions, Westminster Hall debates, topical questions, topical debates, uh, allowing members to have phones in the chamber. Uh, so it was quite a long techie but of interest to members report and then in the session where I was the clerk uh, so everything changed Harriet Harman came in she was the leader of the house uh, she was tasked with doing this uh, governance of Britain agenda and I think things started to go slightly wrong from that point uh, and that's for kind of three main reasons so first of all some of the subjects were frankly quite boring um, and possibly not what you would call modernization. Um, so as a clerk, we were sort of scratching around trying to find anyone who would come and talk to us about uh, the advantages of debating departmental accounts in the chamber. Um, and I sticks in the mind, I remember the, the draft report that we offered to the chair on that. The only feedback that I got was, could you please make it a bit longer? So, so that wasn't a brilliant start. Uh, and then um, very much the committee was run as an executive committee. And obviously we've covered that. It's always been the case that it was chaired by the leader of the house. Um, but particularly Harriet Harman came in to chair that committee having never been a backbencher at all. When she was elected, she came straight to the front bench. Uh, then she was leader of the house uh, and she'd really never actually served on any select committee in any capacity. So the whole idea of how select committee works by kind of um, forging consensus uh, really wasn't particularly there in her style. 
uh, at the time, which is quite interesting because, you know, contrast that with, with the Partygate inquiry, and I think there's, there's quite a big difference. Um, but it meant that um, that combined with the fact that we've kind of been charged with this, getting this green paper stuff through, meant that everything really divided among party lines rather than among modernizers versus non-modernizers, which, which might have been the case before. Uh, and there wasn't really much attempt to generate that um, consensus through any kind of compromise. And then uh, what finally killed off the committee, which is a, a, a meeting that very much sticks in my mind, uh, was this inquiry we did on regional accountability. So the issue at stake was that uh, Gordon Brown had uh, appointed all of these regional ministers for different parts of England. You know, it's a decent policy issue. How do you get accountability for quangos and things that are working regionally that don't have a line into parliament? Uh, and the proposal was that there would then be regional select committees to be attached to those ministers. And it was not agreed between Labour and the Conservatives. Uh, the Conservatives didn't want them, they thought they were too expensive, they thought they would interfere with the existing select committee system, they wanted to have grand committees as a kind of light touch version of that, um, but Harriet Harman clearly had been told to just get this through the committee in any way possible. Um, so the day before the, the committee was due to, to meet to consider its report, uh, I remember Theresa May rang me up in my office on my desk phone, so it shows how long, long, long ago it was, uh, and she was a very lovely uh, member to work with. She was the shadow leader at the time and said, mm, I just thought I should let the clerks know that we are going to be pushing every single clause to a division. And I was like, yes, thank you very much, Mrs May. Helpful to know that. Uh, had a bit of a sinking feeling at that point, uh, went for lunch, had a further sinking feeling in the afternoon when my lunch uh, resulted in getting severe food poisoning. Spent the entire afternoon throwing up in the toilets of the office. Uh, went home to bed, got up in the morning for our 9am meeting, still feeling pretty rough. Uh, and we had 30 consecutive divisions on all of the regional select committee staff, all of which were carried on Harriet Harman's casting vote. And uh, you probably know most of the people here that the way that you do divisions in select committees is the clerk stands up and reads everyone's name and they all say I or no. Uh, so I did that 30 times having felt blimmin' awful. It was like some kind of weird fever dream the report was pushed through, regional select committees were set up, they lasted for one session, they disappeared, and pretty much the committee never met again after that. So it really was quite a, a confrontational meeting, there was no trust really left between the members, and um, there was not much left on the agenda, so the remaining stuff in the governance of Britain never really got looked at. Um, but just to finish off, I guess uh, what I would draw from that in terms of lessons for the new committee is, are they, uh, what subjects are they looking at? Are they really modernisation or are they things like standards or policy issues that can't find a home somewhere else? Uh, do they have any aspects of cross-party support? And then very much going back to what Greg said about personalities, who the chair is and who the members are make a massive difference. And generally speaking, people want to be on that committee either because they're very pro-modernisation or because they want to stop modernisation. Those are the two reasons. Uh, and how that is managed within the committee, I think, has quite a big effect. So I'll stop there. That is brilliant. Thank you so much, Sue. There's some real... <laughs> that was quite entertaining and also some serious salutary tales, I think, for the new leader of the House uh, and, and the new committee. And indeed, perhaps anybody who's looking at the possibility of implementing a large set of proposals from Gordon Brown involving regional matters. But... They, that might be beyond the scope of um, <clears throat> this, this particular event. Um, let me ask you all um, a few questions just to get it going. Uh, but before I do, uh, let me remind, there are some questions coming in. I can see we've got some uh, serious experts in the audience, some of whom have already submitted some questions, but I want to very strongly uh, encourage the audience to submit more. Uh, we do not have enough as yet, so um, please get going. Um, and also to mention, I hope um, we were actually contacted by a clerk of the new Modernization Committee who wanted to encourage people here who are interested in this topic to sign up to its mailing list. And we've been provided with a link for that, which I hope will be put in the chat for everybody. Um, so let me get going, there it is. Let me get going with some questions. Um, maybe going back, Tom, to, to you. Um, in terms of scene setting, Greg and Sue both mentioned various topics. And I just wonder um, more for the context, really, 
Um, if you could just run us through some of the key things that were achieved by the previous successful uh, modernization committee. But what also might be interesting would be to hear what happened afterwards, because I think your report shows the modernization committee was very successful in achieving reform. The procedure committee, which was there all the way through the before the modernization committee, all the way through and then subsequently was significantly less uh, successful. So it might be interesting to hear one or two things that the procedure committee hasn't been able to get done, which perhaps will be on the agenda for the modernization committee and whether that maybe suggests that, you know, the modernization committee has come just at the right time to get some things done that are on the agenda. Yeah, thanks, Meg. So um, on what uh, on things that did happen, I suppose a lot of the early attention, I think as Greg sort of noted, was things around the legislative process, some of the things that now seem quite normal parts of how bills go through the House of Commons um, around carryover, things like programming. That was a lot of the early work of, of the, the committee. But then, it, as, as has also already been noted, it varied over time in its attention to different topics, largely partly due to the external politics, partly due to um, the characters and goals of the leaders of the House. So uh, under Robin Cook, there was lots of attention to the select committee system, trying to make that somehow more independent, more powerful, and let committee chairs be alternative career paths. Uh, under Jack Straw later on, there was some talk about sort of how to connect Parliament better to the public, and there were various changes uh, around that. But as you say, after then, um, the momentum, I think, slightly went out of reforms. Initially, of course, that we had the right committee in 2009-10, which um, did see some of the biggest reforms perhaps we've had really in the last couple of decades in the House of Commons that led to these changes whereby select committee chairs are now elected by MPs as they were this week, and the members are chosen by these within party elections. That also saw the introduction of backbench business, which is a topic we might touch on. So there were some quite big changes there that came about largely due to the opportunity given by the expenses crisis that led Gordon Brown to uh, accept to Tony Wright MP's idea of setting up this new committee. And even though the changes were in reality, nothing at all to do with the, the MP's expenses crisis, that created the political moment in which some, some reforms could happen. Since then, the procedure committee has got things done, but I think it's, um, I think we found around sort of 50% or so of its, its sort of procedural recommendations do tend to get passed. But if you look at the types of things it's done, they've often been quite technical, quite small, often perhaps quite important. Um, but it's not perhaps been sort of major overhauls of how things work that they've been able to successfully get through. And in terms of frustrations, I think maybe the main one to highlight would be around the private members bills process, something that lots of MPs find quite frustrating sometimes, and that looks often completely baffling to people uh, outside Parliament who uh, are often led to expect that a particular piece of legislation is something they should be pushing MPs to vote for, only to discover that it's got zero chance of being debated because it's sort of 20th in the ballot or not even in the ballot and so on. And so that was an area that successive procedure committee reports suggested there should be reforms of the bit of back and forth with the government. Um, and in increasingly exasperated tones, the committee would put out new reports saying we tried with the government, we've not really got anywhere, we've revised our proposals. Um, and in the end, basically got to the position where they said, you know, the system risks being brought into serious disrepute, but the government's unwilling to move on this and we can't make progress until they do. And I think that's probably an area that from their work where there's clearly an agenda where they tried to push through reform, but just had no luck. Yeah, there's a very interesting dynamic, I think, described in your report, whereby a backbench committee, a wholly backbench committee like the procedure committee can find itself sort of banging its head against the wall, but then a committee that has front bench leadership can be seen as too government controlled and, and somewhat somehow you're trying to get compromise on achieving reform through one or other route which might take me to a, a, a question to Greg and Sue uh, you put a lot of emphasis on the importance of the chair and I think you could say you know that that contrast between the procedure committee and the modernization committee uh, you're maybe looking for sort of a sweet spot um, between backbench control and frontbench control. And I think you're looking for a sort of sweet spot, perhaps with the leader as well. It's very interesting, I think, that um, I think it was Sue who referred to Jack Straw as the leader of the committee. He actually, unfortunately, falls between the period that the two of you are describing, after Peter Hayne, but before Harriet Harman. Greg talked about how Robin met many obstacles in number 10 and so on, and he had a rather bad relationship with the chief whip. Um, Maybe Harriet was rather at the other end from what Sue was saying. I've always wondered whether Jack actually kind of hit that sweet spot 
whereby he had sufficient independence, but also sufficient trust. What, what, what would you say about those sort of dynamics and what's the, what's the right place to be as a, as a leader of the house in order to maximally get things done, Greg? Um, there's, I mean, there's no easy answer to that, there, really. I think you're right about Jack. I mean, again, he was, I think he was seen again, like Robin, as very much a parliamentary, you know, a parliamentary man, as he was called at the time. Uh, and again, had come from being foreign secretary, but but had far more trust than than Robin had um, as as leader of the House. And whether, whether that enabled him to get more done or not, I don't, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, the, the challenge, the issue with Robin, I mean, it was one... I mean, bear in mind, we were also special advisors to Robin in the run up to the Iraq war. And now this is this was a sort of running sore in all of those discussions as well, because Robin, you know, Robin's barely concealed objections to what was happening up to the early part of 2003 also informed this. But it was also, as you said, you know, him and Hillary Armstrong as a chief whip just on a personal level didn't get on. And they both, I think thought that the other person was trying to do aspects of their job or telling them what to do. And the, the, I mean, I think the, the uh, all of it started, I think, with that, with that PLP meeting where the nominations for the select committees were put forward. And as I mentioned, Gwyneth Dunwoody and Donald Anderson were, were suddenly not only not chairs of those committees, but not on the committees at all, as far as I remember. And the first question in that PLP meeting was from Gwyneth Dunwoody, who said, why am I not in this committee? And why did I not find out about it until 10 minutes before the meeting started? And I think what happened subsequent to that was Robin was just really irritated that he'd been put in this position where he had to fit up, you know, the way he saw it, he had to fix a problem which had been created by the whips, which had blown off his plans to do all sorts of stuff. And I think, you know, not that he ever articulated this, but he was probably not that happy about not being foreign secretary anymore. Um, I mean, he was never that explicit with us at the time, but it was it was it was clear that that was that was a running sore. The problem that we hit was because those personal relations between Robin and the chief whip weren't great. It spilled out, so there was there was no trust on either side, which meant number ten in particular sought to place more and more restrictions on what we were doing. By you know there was a you know a, a, a committee that we we'd created with uh, members of the political office in number ten. They wanted to see what was being discussed before you know before it was approved. There was then a cabinet subcommittee NISC twenty one which was created to try and widen out the you know basically it was putting more and more obstacles in front of Robin. Now actually from Robin's point of view this helped him in terms of his legitimacy within the house because he could explain to people, look at all these obstacles that, that Downing Street is putting in my way. I am, I want the best to, for, for Parliament. And, and to some extent, it sort of strengthened that. But it, you know, bluntly, it didn't make it easy. there's a risk there, isn't there, that Robin sort of, you, you risk falling into the procedure committee trap, that you're speaking for the House and you're shut out by the government. Well, yeah, I mean, and it was, uh, uh, I was just saying before the meeting started, I, uh, at one point, uh, Pat McFadden, who was... Um, uh, in the political office at number 10 at the time, uh, was it complained to me that Robin's problem was that he thought he was a shop steward for the back benches. Now, that wasn't the way that Robin saw that role. But I think, unlike the, I mean, I think unlike the procedure committee, the Robin, the, the status of the chair of that committee, the procedure committee is the part of the reason the modernization committee was established was because the procedure committee was generally seen as very slow moving very under the radar, very low key with, with not real significant people on it. Regardless of Robin's problems, he would have always, he, he had clout, you know, as, as you know, Meg, he had, he had a following within the PLP, people trusted him. And I don't think you'd ever get a procedure committee chair or membership with that same sort of level of political influence and clout, I think. Interesting. Uh, the Procedure Committee Chair, of course, was elected yesterday, um, yeah. <clears throat> and Kat, Kat Smith won a competitive election over Stella Creasy, so it's going to be very interesting to see what Kat Smith does with that committee, and I'd like to come on 
in a moment to the relationship between the different committees. But Sue, do you have any comments on this sort of sweet spot? And I don't yeah. know, I, I didn't quite do it, but I don't know whether anybody else was frantically Googling to see how much backbench experience Lucy Powell has. Because I think what you said about Harriet Harman there was really interesting. And I, I have a feeling Lucy Powell might be similar. Mm. I think it, it, the, the personality of the chair definitely has a huge effect, but it's also who is setting the agenda and where is it coming from? Um, because a lot of what uh, I, I, I did take over from the previous Clark Gordon, who had, had uh, worked with Jack Straw and, uh, you know, I, a lot of what they were doing had come organically from backbench members and then been picked up and okay things have been added in but it was a combination of what the government will wear plus what people want to see um kind of mixed together and that's that sort of I think the modernization committee has kind of had peaks and troughs of it mainly coming from government wanting x to be done and got through and on the other side picking up the kind of organic feelings amongst backbenchers that they would like to do something differently and marrying those two together is, is possibly the, the sweet spot to get to. I think it's interesting that we're keeping this word modernization in the name of the committee and we're not calling it something like reform of the House of Commons for instance because you know I'm not that close to it anymore but just looking at the subjects that they are they have on their agenda and where they come from it's not and scream modernization to someone to the real world I wouldn't have thought you know if you think modernization you think you know tech or you know, maybe parental leave for MPs or stuff that happened in COVID that was temporary, are we going to make that permanent? Whereas a lot of what is, is coming down the track now seems more standards reform -y, and is this just a nice place to put that because we don't want to give it to procedure or we don't want to do it ourselves. Um, so I think all of that, there needs to be a mixture of picking up on things that people want generally speaking, as well as kind of uh, putting stuff on the agenda proactively from the, ch the chair or the leader. Uh, a little birdie tells me that Lucy Powell has three years experience as a member of the Education Select Committee. So we should feel optimistic about that. That's good. Um, I'm just going to put one more question around you all and then go out to the audience because uh, there's lots of good questions coming in, um, which is this question about the relationship, the scope of the committee, I suppose, this fact that, as Tom indicated, um, it's, it's, it's claiming to be, first of all, a clearing house, and secondly, that it's covering standards and working practices as well as procedure. Um, Tom, I don't know if there's any more that you want to tell us about that or any sort of, you know, feelings that you've got about open questions regarding that. And then I'd just like to ask Sue and Greg to reflect on the, the extent, if any, to which this was true of the previous committee and how the intercommittee relationships work, because clearly we have the standards committee. But back then, we also, of course, always had the procedure committee. So did you have anything to do with standards and so on? And how did the, the, the procedure committee relationship work? But, but Tom, is there anything else you'd like to add about what we know about the current situation? Yeah, I could say a few things. So I guess, firstly, from this um, uh, memo that they published yesterday and, the, and from some of the earlier discussions, I think it seems like the leader of the house is envisaging the relationship to work in sort of two directions. There's been mention on the one hand of the committee picking up proposals from others, including other select committees, there's also, it seems to be some proposal that the committee might ask the other committees to look into things uh, in its area. And so quite how that sort of two way traffic works, I think it's yet to, I think, be really worked out in practice. And they might discover when they actually try and apply it that the, the politics lead them down a different route. It was also something that was picked up during the uh, the debate on establishing that the committee, um, that debate it didn't go into huge amounts of detail in part because there were lots of sort of maiden speeches that crowded some of that out perhaps but there was um some discussion from people connected to those other committees including um alberto costa who's now been elected as uh, the chair of the standards committee in, um, in this in the new house commons um about exactly what this re how the overlaps of these remits would work and whether there could be sort of constructive division of labor or stepping on toes i think one approach they could take would be to say well we're going to look at this part of it and you can go and look at that part and put them to sort of um, carve up things in that way. Um, alternatively, if they are going to relate to each other, I think there's going to be some important questions for 
the Modernisation Committee and perhaps therefore particularly the Leader of the House to answer about what this clearing house role means. On the one hand, if they're intending to try and sort of commission work from the other committees, those other committees and their chairs might well think it's none of their business to tell their committee what to do. They've got their own priorities. They want to get on with things. Um, on the flip side, if they instead say, OK, we'll act as the clearinghouse when your ideas come out and we'll look at them, those other committees might think we don't need you as a clearinghouse. We've thought about our ideas. We think they're sensible. We'd like you to just put them to MPs for a debate. And so I think, um, again, coming back to the importance of personalities and politics and relationships, I think it's going to be particularly important that the leader of the House and the chairs of those other committees get their heads together and work out quite what the relationship between them is going to be and how that's going to work to ensure this is constructive rather than just causes arguments and tensions. Yeah, and as as you say, as of as of yesterday, we know that it's Alberto Costa at Standards, who is a, of course a Conservative peer, although a Conservative MP, sorry, uh, which hopefully shouldn't matter. And then you've got Cat Smith at Procedure. S Sue, do you have any reflections on the, the the question about standards and also just working across committees mm. uh, based on your experience? I mean, good luck with that, is, was, was my instant thought. Um, because I, I, just to take the last part first, telling other committees to do something it has never been brilliantly successful in my experience. Possibly there are other... Um, Especially perhaps when it comes from the Leader of the House, or, or, or maybe the Leader well, of the House so has weight to, to do that. Yeah, in my time we never did really anything that impinged on standards, but obviously all of the, the stuff on regional select committees did impinge on the other departmental committees, and that was the whole issue at hand. So we did have a session where we had chairs of other committees come in and tell us whether they thought it was a good idea or not. And it was basically the Labour one said, yeah, this is a great idea. And the Conservative one said, no, it's a terrible idea. So, you know, I'm not sure what we really got from that that we didn't already know. I think we did do some work with the Procedure Committee on the more techie things, uh, like the um, uh, dissolution and recall one. But then I suppose there is a bit of a question about why were we really doing it when it was a very procedure uh you know they could have done it themselves and it wasn't particularly controversial and it probably wouldn't have have needed a leader to kind of push that through uh i suppose making time for it is one of the key things because some of these things are just never going to get on the agenda unless time is made uh for that to happen so and the leader is the one who is obviously in the position to be able to do that so i think that's the crucial route really yeah Great, thank you, Greg. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm trying to work out what to add to it, all of that because I think that sort of covers it. I mean, I think the the I mean, our experience of the the modernisation committee its relationship with other committees was um, there's a, there's a point I'm making my my recently published book about um, how how political reform tends to happen, um, which makes the point that in parliamentary institutions it's often the case that reform is a, is a process of bricolage where because of the, the the way in which parliaments are constructed it's very difficult to get rid of a committee once it's been established because there are people such as the chair who want that committee to continue and so what you tend to find is that new committees are created without actually removing what was there previously and just building on top of the remnants of what was there and what tends to happen is that the the new committees or the new um, vehicles create their own space. And that comes really with sort of political heft. And I think with having somebody like Robin, who had immediately been foreign secretary as chair of that committee, people moved out of the way because they could see that he was going to uh, make something of this. And the procedure committee was already relatively uh, low key. It became even more low key because I didn't think, I don't think they thought there was any point in in trying to compete with the modernization committee under under his leadership lucy i mean with all due respect to lucy she obviously hasn't got the same sort of political heft that robin had but also the members of the committee of the modernization committee a lot of a lot of them are really are brand new um uh, and the modernization committee from 97 2001 had a lot of people who had a lot of experience and knew what to do but the second broad point i was going to make in relation to that was that the parallels between this committee and the 97 one are quite significant because if you look at the, the Labour manifesto in 97, there wasn't a lot of mention about, you know, reform of parliament, but there was a lot of stuff about standards and ethics in the wake of Nolan. And the, the focus of, of, you know, you know, reforming parliament was about improving the ethics of, of, 
of the place. And then you had a large new intake of members in 97. And it wasn't really until 2001 when a lot of those members had four years experience and could see a lot of the problems, like the stuff Tom mentioned around private members' bills. You've got, you know, what, 355 new members in this parliament. They won't know how to do the job yet and they won't know the frustrations of trying to do the job that are caused by the procedures and the processes. But in four years' time, they will. And you could see you could see a parallel to what happened between 97 and 2001. So that by the time you get to the next election and next, if there is a modernization committee, then you will have a weight of opinion behind certain the need to reform certain parts of parliamentary procedure, which perhaps aren't there at the moment, given the fact you've got so many new members in this parliament. That is really interesting. And another another factor which has really only just occurred to me while listening to you speak is that, of course, we have an appointed modernization committee, as Tom said, but an elected chair of the procedure committee, which will have elected members. So there are sort of competing legitimacies there, aren't there, which didn't really exist in the past, because of course, the procedure committee was also an appointed committee back then. So there's lots of stuff here where there are resonances to the past, but there's also a lot of kind of unique circumstances about this new this this new moment. I'm going to call Hannah back onto the screen because uh, we've got lots of uh, fascinating questions that have come in. Um, and Hannah's going to uh, put some of them to the panel. Uh, you're going to put them in groups of, I guess, about three. Yes, uh, we've got a good group of questions on how the new committee can get things done. So Paul Evans says, the leader of the House's memo hints at swapping backbench time for more time for government legislation. That's an arguable case, given that the backbench business committee's lackadaisical approach to its task, but it's only worth it if legislative legislative scrutiny gets better. How can the modernization committee make that happen? Paul Tyler says that Lucy Powell has indicated that inadequate scrutiny of legislation will be a priority for the new committee. Um, given the terrible lapses in scrutiny of COVID and Brexit secondary legislation in both houses, will her government colleagues let her do anything meaningful? And Andrew Kennan, who says he was a clerk who advised Anne Taylor, Anne Taylor and Margaret Beckett on modernization when they were in charge of the committee, said that the whips did their level best to sabotage those modernization reforms. And what assurance is there that this will not happen again? Wow. Uh, that's a pretty expert group of questioners with some very, very good questions. I might just pull Paul Evans up on his suggestion that the lackadaisical attitudes of the Backbench Business Committee does mean that uh, reforming the legislative process uh, to give it less time is, is perhaps warranted. We could, of course, look to making it less lackadaisical and reforming that. So I think that's two challenges. Um, how should we take this? Some of this sounds very Greggish in terms of the uh, WIP uh, dynamics. Sue, you actually worked uh, with the Backbench Business Committee, so you might want to comment um, on that one. So why don't we go Greg, Sue, Tom? I was hoping you weren't going to come to me first, so I had a bit more time to think about these answers. I mean, I think on the back bit, I mean, I'm going to defer the Backbench Business Committee to you, Meg, because I think you're in the best position to answer a lot of that. In terms of the other questions about the whips sabotaging in the space for um, uh, for, for Lucy Powell to actually achieve significant reform, as I as I said earlier, I mean the, the parallel there, there are parallels with uh, I think Anne Taylor came into the job as leader of the House and chair of the Modernisation Committee as a genuine reformer, but this was a new government which hadn't been in power for, for twenty almost twenty years and suddenly realised that all these commitments to reform the House of Commons would make their lives more difficult. And I think there's going to be a similar thing here. I think the slight difference is that, as has been said, the focus of this modernisation committee's remit is much more on ethics, given what's gone on in the last few years in Parliament. Um, and, you know, the work of Chris Bryant and others in, in, in pushing a lot of this stuff forward. And, and as you say, uh, Alberto Costa is as chair of the Standards Committee is going to be a significant counterweight to whatever the Modernisation Committee does. Um, and there is not, this, I think, quite the same focus on reforming procedures to improve legislation or ministerial accountability. And I just don't see that there's the same weight of opinion within Parliament that that is a, a priority with the size of the Labour majority and with the number of new MPs that... Um, are in Parliament. Re reform ultimately depends on the the opinions of the majority of 
members of parliament themselves. And as I said, you've got 355 new MPs who are learning how to do the job and won't, you know, won't have a full feel for uh, the problems caused by the current structure of the institution for a year, two years, three years, possibly, because that's that's when they'll be learning learning the job. In terms of the Andrew's point about the uh, the sabotage, this was. I, I sort of agree with you, Andrew, up to a point. I think the acti- it, the activities of whips were less were were less overt than um than is often portrayed there was a lot of i I remember it being described at the moment uh the time by some of the whips as as freelance activity by individual whips there was clearly an animosity between the business manager between the leader of the house and the chief whip and the chief whip clearly wasn't stopping the the whips from you know individual whips from working against us but there was not a formal whipping operation against a, a lot of this stuff because because the ultimately these reforms got through because the PLP voted for the reforms around committees, around sitting hours, around uh, all sorts of other stuff. And the and this is a point I make in, in my book is that you know for all of the changes that Robert put through, many of which had significant long term effects in improving the work of the committees and the resources available to to, to committees and, and, and on the legislative process. The issue which most divided opinion within the House of Commons and heated tensions to boiling point with the WHIP's office was the one issue which had nothing to do with the quality of parliamentary scrutiny. It was to do with sitting hours. It was about personal preference, about what hours the House of Commons sit. And the proposals were to bring forward the sitting hours by three hours on two days a week and it created an enormous argument which uh characterized everything else and that was the, that was the area where we were in most regular and heated argument with the whips office and with number 10 because their their job was to manage the the government's troops and they could see a lot of mps getting very worked up about it um but it had nothing to do with scrutiny and i i, I think you know the had they had they really objected to some of the substantial reforms that Robin was proposing, they would have killed them, but but they didn't. Sue, so, uh, we, we, we have seen some, I think it's fair to say, we've seen some sliding away from former standards of um, legislative scrutiny in recent years. We've seen lots of concerns about the growth of delegated legislation, but also the treatment of primary legislation. Lucy Powell herself was actually quite outspoken. She gave a rather good speech at the Institute for Government saying that she wanted to tighten up all of these things and improve matters. Um, do you? And I, I imagine that Clark's supporting her on the committee will be keen to restore standards. But what, do you have thoughts about the dynamics of achieving that? Um, and the, ta- the the most suitable tactics. Yeah, I I think this goes back a bit. To, it's it's interesting to contrast what Greg was saying about you know new members come in, they don't realise what's going to be annoying, and then over time they experience things, and there starts to become a weight of feeling that mm, this needs to change or that needs to change. I think there's an opposite direction by which new governments come in and say, well, we're going to be much better. We're going to invite scrutiny of everything we do. You can go through all of our stuff in great detail. And then as time passes and that causes them problems, their appetite for that starts to diminish. So you've sort of got these crossed wires in a way of one big appetite, but not really understood maybe by a lot of new members who probably don't even, you know, delegated legislation is not your number one priority when you come in as a new MP to understand how that works. Um, so it's only over time that you start to realise the the consequences of that. And then governments who who gen- I'm not saying this is really malicious in any way, but come in with this idea that it's going to be new and different, and then hit really practical problems of not being able to get stuff through, and decide that maybe that wasn't such a good idea in the first place. Um, the other thing I was going to say was on the Backbench Business Committee, because I did work for that as well in the first year it existed with Andrew. Um, and in its original form, it was not lackadaisical at all. In fact, it was a very unlackadaisical committee and so unlackadaisical that I think that's where it got itself into trouble because it was uh, awkward for government. It did bring up subjects that would not otherwise have got debated. It did manage to get them onto the floor of the House. and eventually the whips did not like that so much that they 
wanted to clip its wings. So, you know, after I think the first couple of se sessions, some of the members of that committee who were the awkward squad were no longer members of it. And, you know, those members were elected. So in theory, they could, they stood again, but, you know, pressure, can, even if members are elected, pressure can be applied here and there in the background for people to not stand or not be voted for. So it's not a purely, you know, um, necessarily a purely straightforward uh, process. Mm. And again, maybe we're sort of talking about sweet spots between getting government business and backbench business and keeping everybody sufficiently happy, because if one side encroaches too much, the other side becomes unhappy. Yeah. Exactly. Tom, do you want to add anything in, in, in this round? Yeah, yeah. Um, some just quick reflections. So on, on Andrew's question about what assurance we have that the whips uh, won't try to sabotage this, I think well, so far, having you know reread the memo from um, the leader of the House this morning, there's nothing in there that makes me think that the whips would have any particular problem with it at the minute. The, the committee... The sort of the agenda that Lucy Powell seems to have set for the committee doesn't seem to be of the sorts of things that would be um, curbing the whip's influence over appointments or making it harder to get legislation through and so on, if anything, quite the opposite. And so it seems perhaps less likely than on some of those things that Greg was talking about, those kind of interests are going to be going to be activated, but we'll see. Um, and so perhaps for the same reason where, uh, you know, where, where Paul has said, well, the government colleagues actually let Lucy Powell improve these things. I mean, I don't think there's not been any mention, I don't think, thus far around the modernization committee itself of touching anything to do with statutory instruments perhaps they will perhaps that will come out as they develop their work and they listen to others but so far that doesn't appear to be on their agenda and to go back to sue's point about governments coming in with ideas and then losing interest in those ideas as they go on we might think well if it's it's, if it's not even in their initial list of priorities that perhaps it's unlikely to appear in their later ones but we shall see um, and then lastly uh, paul evans point about whether um reducing backbench business time in order to make more time for legislation can actually be made to improve scrutiny, I suppose. Uh, so I think this, the sentence in the government's memo, they say, um, Lisa Powell says she's committed to treating parliamentary time as the precious resource that it is. And this means placing a greater emphasis on members scrutinising government legislation going forwards. I suppose the key thing is that giving more time to scrutinising legislation is only going to mean better or more effective scrutiny if a, that time is used effectively by the MPs to scrutinise it, and B, if that time isn't just filled by a commensurate increase in the amount of legislation they're being asked to deal with, it might simply be that you have more time in order to get through more bills, and so it would do nothing at all to improve the scrutiny of it, um, which I think points to perhaps a challenge in that we're discussing the work that this committee will do and the procedural reforms it might undertake. But I think lots of this stuff comes back to tweaking the rules and the institutions isn't necessarily the kind of the, the only or even a sufficient thing you might do. And some of this is cultural. Ultimately, for MPs to be scrutinising legislation better, they need to be interested in it. They need to know how to do it, but they also need to care and see it as a priority. Um, and the government needs to do things that makes that easier for them by scheduling enough time, giving them enough notice of their proposals, being open to amendments uh, and so on. And so lots of that stuff, I don't think anything the Modernisation Committee could do could fix. I think MPs and the government um, have to approach the legislative process with a particular mindset. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's worthwhile remembering that um, Parliament doesn't only scrutinise bills on the floor of the House. Um, it should be scrutinising bills primarily in public bill committees, which, thanks to Jack Straw's reform, to take take evidence from external actors and hopefully make sort of evidence based decisions. And actually, one of the things, ironically, which has been going wrong with the legislative process in recent years is that recent governments have been pushing through too many bills through committees of the whole house, which miss out. Uh, that evidence taking and rushing them through. So in some sense, he's making more space on the floor of the House for legislation might not be a good thing. We need to think about how to improve the committee process as well. So there's lots of complicated things here. Um, Hannah, uh, you've got lots more useful questions. Yep. Uh, Liz Spate, addressing Greg's point about the lack of experience of the members, says, is there a counterpoint that some of the new MPs might have insights into some things that need modernization as they bring a fresh perspective and are not yet institutionalized? Alan Davis said, with the chair as a member of the government and supported by SPADs and civil servants, how does this change the clerk's role? And Julia Cushion asked, how should the committee draw on external expertise? Excellent questions. Tom, would you like to go first this time? Thanks, Meg. Well, it feels uh, like lots of these are probably best left to, to Sue and Greg in terms of their uh, more direct experience of it. Um, I suppose on that very last question about expertise and just, um, just a small observation, 
I think this will partly depend on how the committee goes about its work. Um, we don't yet know if it's going to be holding inquiries, announcing calls for evidence and doing the usual collection of written and oral evidence and so on that we might expect. Um, if instead they're going to be picking up the reports that come from uh, these other committees, looking at them and then rapidly coming up with some kind of view, it seems there'll be less role for the expertise to come directly to their committee and it might instead be coming in earlier in the process via those other committees. And so this is another in the bucket I think of um, we'll discover more on quite what is realistic or desirable as the committee actually gets up and running and we and perhaps the members of that committee sort of work out how they're going to go about this. Thank you. Uh, Greg? Yeah, I mean, on that, that point about expertise, I think um, there, there is a tendency for the reform process to be incredibly insular. Uh, and I think, you know, anything which, and I say this, you know, given what I do now, which has been, you know, working with uh, MPs and parliaments in, in more than 60 countries over the last 20 years, there's a huge amount of innovation from other places, which would be incredibly useful, I think, for the House of Commons to reflect upon. Um, and to also recognise that the, the House of Commons is itself a bit weird. And, you know, every institution grow, develops its own ways of working over a period of time, as norms grow up and practices emerge, and you start to assume that this is this is the only way that things can be done. So I think that certainly from a, you know, international comparisons and perspectives and just getting ideas and, and experience from other places would be incredibly be useful. Um, on the point about the, the new MPs, um, uh, that's I mean the, 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 they will bring new insights and um, uh, and experiences which could change some of those 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 more uh, stultifying aspects of, of the way the House of Commons works. I think there's absolutely a point to that. The the problem, and again, I've written about this in in my book, which I should I should really have with with me to ho to hold up. Um, but I th the counter to that is that I'll try and keep this as short as possible. And I keep saying there's 355 new MPs, it's not, it's 335, it was 51% turnover this, at this election. Um, but what's striking is the level of turnover that there has been in the House of Commons since 2010. There are now, I think, fewer than 60 MPs in the House of Commons who had been elected before 2010. That's, the, the Commons has never uh, faced that level of turnover. And the problem with parliaments is that you you don't learn to be an MP by being taught or trained. You learn by doing it and you learn by watching what other people are doing and copying them. You absorb the people, as Michael Rush has written at length, you know, MPs aren't taught. They're socialised into their roles by the experience of watching other MPs and what they're doing and absorbing all of those norms. And I think that that has both a positive and a negative aspect to it it can just reinforce a lot of the bad ways of working but equally it's a, it has been a way of of ensuring certain standards and it's in in the last few years we've seen such um deviation from the norms of what was acceptable behavior in government and parliament at a time when there has been a massive turnover in Parliament, and the two things may well be connected in in every, and it, this is not just true of Parliament, but in every organisation, every institution, the moral standards of and the ethical standards of that organisation are are not enforced by the the professional code of conduct. It's by the attitude of everybody else you're working with that you're kept in line. That this is this is acceptable or this is not acceptable. It's the norms that have evolved, and those. Those norms in Parliament, in the House of Commons at the moment, seem to me very fragile. Um, and I think that that's a that's a big problem which the the Commons is going to have to address. How do these new MPs, these 335 new MPs, learn how to be MPs? It's 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 quite striking that I mean the other factor in all of this is obviously COVID. So in 2019, you had, I think about 20% turnover at that at that election. Um and the new MPs were in the Westminster precincts for about eight working weeks, I think, before COVID hit, uh, and then they disappeared. And you, if you talk to some of the clerks who are on the on this on this uh, webinar, at the end of the last Parliament, they were reflecting on many MPs who still hadn't learned how to do aspects of the job, some of the basics, because they hadn't been exposed to that that you know to their colleague, their more experienced colleagues, and learnt you know and absorbed how to do the job properly. And that's with with this turnover, 
you know the, the potential for that to go in interesting directions is 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 very great i think and an issue for the whips the labor whips in particular with such a large number of new mps is how do these mps learn to do their job and who are they going to learn it from so yeah, yeah there's both pros and cons to that yeah really important questions sue do you want to come in there was specific question yeah. about pressures on the clerks yes um, and you may have thoughts about the other questions as well expertise and new mps well, just to comment on the, the role of the clerk of the committee, I think the question was about does the leader get support from civil service and SPADs and so forth, and does that change the role of the clerk? In 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 my case, and I think for some time before that, it, it didn't. The, there wasn't really any visible support for uh, the chair from civil service or, or SPADs or so forth. Um, I'm sure it was there in the background, but not, not um, hugely present. And actually the role of the clerk on those committees was probably more um, involved than it, it could be on some others, because you are talking about changes to procedures, then does that have knock-on consequences? How, you know, a lot of that comes from uh, clerks to comment on. And uh, I mentioned the, the Jack Straw report on the backbench member. I mean, that I, I recall was a huge piece of work that involved loads of clerks at various, we were all drafted in to do little bits of it because we were looking at things like, what's the average speaking time for a front bencher versus a backbencher in minutes over this session? And has it changed over time and all of this? And it's, it's all of the really geeky stuff that clerks quite often love to do. Uh, <laughs> so it's actually what makes it quite an, interesting uh, or was quite an interesting committee to, to work for I'm sure it will be again. Great thank you let's go back to Hannah maybe one or two quick questions before we wrap up um, we'll all have to be quite quick because we're wrapping up at quarter past. Uh, yeah we've got a couple of anonymous questions um, firstly how useful were ideas from MPs as opposed to those from outside to the previous committee um, in the past there were reformers such as Tony Wright and Andrew Thierry do such internal pressures for reform exist today and then does the panel think that the right committee reform agenda so far has not been fully delivered or to be on the agenda of the new committee mm. um, Tom do you want to come in You've got you 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 know about what's left on the agenda by the right committee. I do. I suppose the main thing left is this. Um, the main thing that was left uh, unimplemented with this idea of there being a sort of house business committee and a sort of votable weekly agenda, rather than it being um, simply handed down on high by uh, by ministers. Um, whether it would be a good idea or not, it seemed I think um, quite unlikely to be um, at the top of the the committee's agenda. This was brought up, I think, at the the, the speech you mentioned, Meg, that um, Lucy Powell gave at the Institute for Government. Somebody in the audience asked about it, and Lucy Powell's response didn't suggest that it was uh, one of the things about Parliament she was um, sort of had a burning desire to change. And I think if we um, go back to that category of um, reforms which are likely to be helpful to the government or unhelpful to the government, I think um, the longer they're in power, the idea that they get to choose what's set every week and MPs don't have to vote on it is likely to be quite attractive to them. Uh, I have to say one just last very thing, very last quick thing, just to come back um, to Greg's point earlier about the value of new MPs. Um, and I entirely take the point about um, the idea that in order to change the rules, you probably have to understand the rules. And so actually um, being there a while is useful. I think the one aspect of the rules that new MPs might best be best placed to comment on is um, the ways in which they look opaque or are hard to understand or make it really hard to follow. And of course, maybe they'll learn how to use them over time, so it's less of a problem for them. But if we think about Parliament as a place that citizens and voters are meant to be able to observe and understand, it may be that the new MP is the best place to highlight which things are either hidden or counterintuitive or badly explained or inaccessible and so on. So those insights perhaps might be especially useful from new MPs. Mm, that's really interesting. Um, you might, Sue and Greg, you may want to comment on on the right thing, um, but uh, perhaps more importantly, the question that Tom can't answer, which is to what extent were there pressures and ideas coming from members in the House back in those days, and do those kind of members still exist, Sue? Mm, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, some of the ideas that came from inside the House. They sound very small, but they can cause the most debate. So the year before I did it, the question about whether members would be allowed to take their phones into the chamber to read emails. Some members really, really wanted to be able to do that. Other members thought it was sacrilege and, you know, you can't possibly ever do that. And, you know, time has passed on. But that that was one of the things in the Jack Straw uh, period 
that they eventually made a decision on to say, yes, they should be allowed to. Uh, and uh, that very much did come from inside. But I wonder, on the right reforms, I think there is a lot of unfinished business there, but it is very tricky in terms of what's in it for me, for the government. And I wonder if it might be worth also going back to the, the previous report, because I think someone did mention earlier connecting parliament with the public, which was another, it, it did address this um, sort of trust deficit and old fashioned, does anyone understand what's going on issue at the time? But it must be about 20 years ago that that report came out. And there are so many things that get raised and dropped that sound small, but could have a big effect. Like, you know, why do we have to call people the honorable member? Why can't we just say you? Uh, things that, you know, the, the normal person on the street might think are quite sensible um, and could make a difference, but who is interested in them or is there any feeling to package all that up into some kind of um, PR campaign for, the house uh, and I'm not sure who would take that on but to me that's something under the heading of modernization that would perhaps be more interesting to explore than some of these other issues. Great thank you Greg um, we've had Tony Wright mentioned Andrew Tyree we could also think about Graham Allen perhaps Mark Fisher and his parliament first group um, were these useful forces and and do they still exist should we miss them if they don't? <laughs> Uh, that is such a loaded and unfair question for me to comment on the merits of such august parliamentarians. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore that. Um, I think the uh, I've managed to grab a copy of my book. If anybody's interested, it's all in here inside uh, the political mind. Yeah, there's a um, link oh, in the chat now. So uh, excellent, Ed's, Ed's good stuff. Proud. Well, the point uh, the, the, on the serious point, which is related to the book, one of the the, the points I'm making there is part of the difficulty of reforming parliamentary institutions is that firstly there's no one person in charge because you have a speaker you have a prime minister you have committee chairs all of whom have a vested interest in how the place is run and an influence over the the process of change but at the same time every member of parliament will have an opinion on how the place works and more importantly they will be able to determine the path of that of that reform. And the challenge is that, that once you've been in Parliament for a while, you can't, I mean, I think all the points that have been made are absolutely right, uh, especially in relation to the opaqueness and ambiguity of the rules and clarifying stuff. And newer members, I think, will see that perhaps more obviously than people who have been there for a while. But as MPs have been there for a while, so they start to identify all sorts of quite small little reforms, as, as Sue was saying, which which might, you, they, they are often... They often come at this with the the zeal of an evangelist um, uh, trying to argue their case. And when Robin was chair of the Modernisation Committee, we did actually consult. We sent a, a, a note out to every MP asking them for ideas. And we got 219 different replies, all of which were carefully drafted, very well thought out and saying entirely different things. Um, and the challenge, I mean, from inside, you tend to get that small, very detailed and pet project sort, sort of reform from MPs themselves. From outside, you tend to get things which are too big, too ambitious or too difficult to implement, like we should reduce the power of the whips. Well, OK, but how do we how do we do that? Because um, that's not the way that Parliament actually works. And I think what you need to be doing is triangulating some of those those big strategic ideas about what's wrong with Parliament from the outside with some of the smaller stuff that you get from MPs on the inside who really understand how the place works. And you need to, to find the balance between the two. And I think that's where interesting reform tends to come from. But ultimately, again, as I say in the book, you know, parliamentary institutions only get stronger if MPs want to make them stronger. And you need to give them a reason for wanting to make them strong, because in many parts of the world, including in, in Westminster, those reasons aren't often that obvious to the MPs themselves. Excellent. Thank you. I think that's a great place to end in terms of challenges for the new committee. We've heard lots of challenges for the committee itself. I think there are challenges for all of us, maybe challenges for MPs to put forward proposals that are big enough and challenges for those on the outside to put forward ideas that are small enough and uh, all of which are uh, sensible and implementable, of course. This has been a fascinating session. Um, I do hope that you in the audience have enjoyed it. Thank you all in the audience for being here. Thank you particularly for your 
questions. Uh, I'm sorry if we didn't manage to get to all of them, uh, but big, big thanks to our speakers. Um, that's been really fascinating. Thanks to Hannah for host for um, managing the questions and to Ed behind the scenes for making the whole thing happen and run so smoothly. Um, if, of course, look out for Tom and Hannah's reports. If you haven't already, look out for their posts on our blog. Look out for Greg's book. Um, sign up to get news from the Modernization Committee if you're interested. Um, as I indicated earlier, a video of this session will be posted shortly on the Constitution Unit website and it will go out as an edition of our podcast. So if you enjoyed it, I hope you'll want to recommend it to other people. Um, news of our next event, uh, it's, it's not quite planned yet, but it's going to be in October. Um, and it will be on how to be a successful select committee chair, timely given the elections yesterday. We've got three uh, former chairs and we'll be posting the date soon. Um, so to be sure that you know about our upcoming events and also our new publications, do sign up to our mailing list. If you're not already on it, you can find it at the Get Involved link on the Constitution Unit website. You can also, as of this week, this is new news, follow the Constitution Unit on Blue Sky. Uh, so do please spread the word about that. Uh, but for now, that is all from us. Uh, thank you, everybody. Goodbye and hope to see you again soon.